sacrifice for the lamb without the flesh of burnt offerings and the fat of sacrifices. In other words, the perfection of the way takes the place of, of sacrifice in the temple. And uh, the walkers in perfection will be separated. That's the separation and going into the wilderness. Uh, as a house of holiness for iron, etc., etc., etc. So it goes on like that in this column nine. And then it gets to this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Nor should he admonish or argue with the men of the pit. They don't like this people they call the men of the pit. But rather he shall conceal the counsel of the Torah from the men of uprightness, of unrighteousness, and admonish uh, with the knowledge of truth and judgment of righteousness the elect of the way. Now they call themselves the elect of the way. Each man according to his spirit, according to the rule of the age. He shall comfort with them his in knowledge and thus illumine them in the marvelous mysteries and truth amid the men of the community, to walk perfectly, again, perfection, each with his neighbor, again, love your neighbor as yourself, in all that is revealed to them. For this is the time of making a way in the wilderness, twice in this document. This is the time of making a way in the wilderness. Therefore he shall instruct them in all that has been revealed, that they shall do, and that doing is very important, instead of faith, it's works. To separate from any man who has not turned his way away from all unrighteousness. Uh, and these are the rules of the way for the guide in these times, loving together with his hating. In other words, they don't love their enemies, according to Christianity and the way Christianity presents things. That it's Deuteronomy, loving and hating and so on. Uh, so there's no, you, you love your neighbor as yourself, but you don't love your enemy. Uh, or you don't love the ungodly either. You're not trying to justify one sinner as better than 99 righteous ones as in the New Testament presentation of Jesus' purported teachings. Now, the reason I say purported because I don't believe those are his teachings personally. And uh, we'll get into that later on. The reason I say purported is because that's a literary document written in the second century, a lot of those things, and we don't know how accurately they report what went on in the 30s of the first century. And we have to read through Paul and James and the scrolls to get at how accurate they can or may not be. So we'll leave that in advance. Therefore, I, I won't take that as an absolute truth, unlike some of the rest of you, which you're welcome to do. Uh, just for the moment, leave it in, in advance. But I want to get here that point about loving and hating. They don't love their enemies. So when people say, oh, Eisman says the scrolls are, are Christian. I don't say the scrolls are Christian. Not Christian the way we define Christian. Palestinian Christianity, if we can use that term? Perhaps. But not Pauline Christianity. And we have to first understand what the difference is. In any case, Christianity is a, is a Greek word, and whatever these were, were ever called by a Greek term. So that's a Greek term coined, as we said last time, in Acts in 1555 AD in northern Syria, um, Antioch. So we don't know what they were called in Palestine. It's Essenes, Hasidim, Hasidians. Um, Nazarenes, Nazarites, all possible terms, zealots, sicari, all possible terms that we'll investigate in this class, but not Christians. So, but we have to talk. So in order to talk, we have to use language that people understand. So since nobody understands what an Essene or a zealot, or even people who say they understand Essenes don't understand what an Essene is. Because if you want to define what an Essene is, you've got to read these documents if you think these are Essenes. And these don't agree with what most people think an Essene is. Most people don't think Essenes are so vindictive, so militant, so aggressive. They think they're like nice, sweet people with halos around their head, sort of uh, contemplating their navel <coughs> somewhere out in the wilderness. Don't mean anyone any harm. That's not this group. This group means a lot of harm to people it considers to be unrighteous. This is a zealot group of a very extreme zealotry. Uh, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. What I'm trying to, uh, to, uh, uh, to get at here is since, since you asked me about carbon dating and things like that, what internal evidence looks like. I'm showing you what internal evidence looks like. This is internal evidence. And you make your own choice on that. And these are the rules of the way for the guide and the times relating to his loving, oh, pardon me, uh, let's see, uh, together with his hating, everlasting, everlasting hatred for the men of the pit, but in a spirit of secrecy. Why? Because the men of the pit are obviously very powerful. Probably the ruling uh, uh, 
establishment in this parish. Uh, everlasting hatred for the men of the pit in a spirit of secrecy to leave them to their riches and toil their hands like a servant to his master or the meek before the individual dictating him. Buck, rather, this person who is <coughs> full of this zeal, he shall be as a man zealous for the law and his time. Oh, pardon me. He should be as a man zealous for the law. So these are zealots for the law. We, we get it right here, and that's what the zealot movement in Palestine is. That's what we're going to discuss when we go through the Maccabee books, the origins of the zealot movement, and uh, how it can relate to these materials. And his time will be that of a man zealous for the day of vengeance. Ah, they are waiting for the day of vengeance. This sounds like Bin Laden here, frankly. Uh, although I'm not sure Bin Laden is interested in righteousness particularly, he's just interested in submission, in Muslim type submission to Islam uh, by righteousness. These people are zealous for righteousness. Uh, anyway, and they are very interested in doing, to do his will in all the work of his hands and in all the dominion as he commanded, in other words, every letter of the law. And he shall freely delight, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's, that's what I would call um, internal evidence and uh, the fact that it twice uses the preparation of the way and earlier uses, uh, uh, speaks about baptism, uses the Holy Spirit language. We don't see any documents from the second, first century BC that even speak like that. There's nothing in Josephus that speaks like that. The only parallel materials that we get is a little bit in the New Testament, but the ethos here is 180 degrees opposite to the New Testament. You understand? I'm not advocating one or the other. I'm not trying to cut your throats. You know, I'm just looking at what happened. I'm not trying to say, you know, you should be a, a man zealous for the day of vengeance. You know, <laughs> it's much easier to be a Paulinist, frankly. But uh, you know, that's good citizenship. You know, Paul in Romans lays out why he who carries the sword shall be, uh, you know, shall be, uh, uh, you know, treated as someone who will be. Uh, treated like that uh, by the sword and the uh, healing. I'll, I'll just read you uh, just this one quick thing before I uh, go back to the Katim problem here. I think I have. I'm going to give with that. Um, I always like to read this so people know what we're talking about because people who are Christian or Jewish or whatever haven't really looked into this stuff very carefully. They listen to what they've been taught, or they think their parents have been taught, and they think that um, if it hasn't ever been raised, that it must have all been decided years, centuries, eons, 